<laughs> Welcome to the Ecclesia Cafe and Piano Bar. I'm the bartender, Angel, and here is Jay. Thank you. Angel, we're very different, huh? Yeah. Slap on a happy grin. <laughs> it's flat sunshine all over the place. Put on a happy face. Yeah, that's a little different study guys at the Alabama here uh, from the show, Bye Bye Birdie. And uh, so let's get into our study for today. And again, it's uh, one of those that we're going to repeat. We're going to go there and come back and go back, go back and forth. Did you have coffee? Oh, you did. You put your coffee. My gosh, but I forgot to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Get your orders in now, folks, for your coffee. And get your Bible and piece of paper and pencil, okay? I apologize for the uh, vocal part. I don't vocalize anymore. I don't practice anymore. But uh, today, today the show is called Broad-Mindedness. Broad-Mindedness. Do you know, are you broad-minded, uh, Angel? You know, the Bible says there's no male or female in the kingdom of God, and so I never look around for any broads. Now, I'm not talking about that kind of a broad. <laughs> I guess for some of you who might not know, a broad sometimes in, California, in the United States is, is uh, a girl, a very nice looking girl. <laughs> Angel says they don't have... Anyway, I won't get into all that. But, uh, <laughs> I got you. All right, I'll take that as your answer. And um, broad-mindedness. And so we're going to start right off with that. And here's the show. Hi, welcome to Get Real 2000. Are you broad-minded? Anyway, that's what the teaching is about here today as we continue on. <clears throat> In a book called Growing Up Fundamentalist by Stefan Ulstein, one after another of his interviews described families that, that stressed the appearance of perfection. One woman speaks of how her mother can't consider the possibility that she made mistakes in her life. Does this sound familiar? Another says everything they do is for show. As they would say, a good witness. Have you heard that before? I've done it too. Well, we have to be a good witness. So we can't, can't let our, ourselves show. If we're before somebody who doesn't know us, well, we have to be a good witness. It's like when you drive your car and you've got uh, bumper stickers on the back praising the Lord and then you're cursing out the window at somebody. That's not being a very good witness. I've seen the other thing too is that God will cause you to prosper. So there's a lot of people that just buy the most expensive clothes and drive the biggest cars and wear jewelry and stuff so that they look like they're prospering. Which would mean that God is really with them. All of this stuff is a bunch of baloney. For legalistic Christians, some of the dirtiest words are those that suggest generosity of spirit towards other people, like the word broad-minded, or tolerant. I remember a lady visiting our little church up in the mountain for the first time, and she said that she believed in every word of the Bible and that she was not tolerant. Like it was uh, something to be seeking. That statement took me back a bit. I thought she was joking with me, but she definitely was not. When it came to someone who might have the aroma of a cigarette or alcohol on their breath, a, a slight body odor from having slept under a bridge or on the street for a night's on end, because they didn't have a job, or one who might look or act as though they were gay, a confessed single mother, 
someone wearing a ba baseball hat in church or just having a good time in the company of other like-minded Christians, which is, after all, fellowship. And that word was in the name of our church. We tolerate the shortcomings of our neighbors when we love them, as Jesus does, right? Do we have to like them? No. But as born-again Christians, Christians, we should automatically love them in the Lord, unconditionally, being broad-minded and tolerant. One legalistic ministry's homepage contains the following of, on broad-mindedness. It says, one, there is no room for broad-mindedness in the chemical laboratory. Water is composed of two parts, hydrogen, and one part oxygen. The slightest deviation from the formula is forbidden. And then two, there is no room for broad-mindedness in music. The skilled director will not permit his first violin to play even so much as one half note off the written note, chord, or key. Three, there is no room for broad-mindedness in mathematics, bio biology, athletics, car repair, and so on, and so on. How then shall we expect that broad-mindedness shall rule in the realm of Christianity and morals? The article, or the uh, homepage reads, He that forsakes the truth of God forsakes the God of truth. Another homepage, one you may... Uh, know this uh, preacher he's on the television all the time I, I kind of really like to listen to him the homepage of Charles Stanley's In Touch strikes a similar note one are you a person who considers himself to be broad minded open to various points of view two if so consider several examples of decision making suppose your doctor said you have a heart disease that requires bypass surgery would you say well any doctor will do give me a pediatrician <laughs> or maybe a general practitioner any physician is acceptable of course not you are very narrow minded when it comes to your health you want the finest cardiologist available. The same holds true when you're looking for a wife or husband or partner for life or a new suit. The truth is none of us are as broad-minded as we think we are. We are broad-minded about some things, but we are very narrow-minded about some other things. The greater the importance or the more serious the consequences of the decision, the more narrow-minded we become. The ways legalistic narrow-mindedness works to stifle love and life and honest communication were strikingly demonstrated by a series of messages posted on an internet message board maintained by Campus Life, which was a magazine for evangelical youth on the, on the internet. The first message came from a 24-year-old guy who did not identify himself. In the first of his messages, posted in June of 1996, he asked, should Christian young people be dying of loneliness? I see that a lot on the internet. He explained that legalism sometimes makes it hard to meet people. It's like every place is a sin. The dance clubs, other churches, activities, even Christian concerts. You're sometimes scared out of knowing anybody. He said later that now, I now fear that God will be angry with me for what I did and for writing this. But I cannot go on in life being this lonely. I need to find some place where there's a young singles group, not just so I can find a girlfriend, but so I can have some, and a whole new set of friends where I can be around. His first message was in June. 
now it was September and he has written many messages about finally finding a large church that his pastor and parents had told him to view as evil but that he found it to be not evil in fact he found he loved it and he found love there and know that God used them the people there to help him in his life soon after however his background caught up with him and he wrote this this is important he said I want to say here that I have spoken some things which were wrong because they concern a man of God and his ministry that is ordained of God he's probably talking about his last pastor in the church he was going to to speak against God or ordained preacher is a terrible sin and a big mistake if anything I have written here in this whole folder is wrong I ask God to forgive me I did not do it being led by God but by sin I repent he says and I will not post anything here ever again may God forgive me wow the guy has a problem and he's not even going to the Lord to help him with it he's going to tradition and legalism the problem has long been for Christians to remake Jesus in their own images <laughs> no matter how selfish or brutal to have the willingness to approve those actions to the extent that they bring Jesus more closely into line with the kind of institutional establishment that Jesus taught his followers to question in many legalistic churches the emphasis on law and doctrine represents in large part an explicit response to other churches emphasis on love one of the ex fundamentalist interviewees in Yulstein's book said I think that we were actually taught not to love the liberals were always talking about love and the social gospel so it was probably a reaction it was almost as if our fundamentalist elders were saying we will preach the truth the hell of love it's kind of hard but let's be legalistic for a minute and accept the idea that every line in the Bible is inerrant truth and that it is unquestionably Jesus talking to us through the word what does the 23rd chapter of Matthew tell us then as legalists it tells us this quite plainly that nothing got Jesus angrier than legalism Jesus warns his religious leaders in Matthew 23 so let's go to Matthew 23 1 I'm in the New Living Translation then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples verse 2 the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the scriptures so practice and obey whatever they say to you but don't follow their example <laughs> for they don't practice what they preach verse 4 14. they crush you with impossible religious demands and never lift a finger to help ease the burden we're talking pretty much in in the book of uh, Matthew Jesus was warning them that they should the laws and the prophets and, and all those legalistic things we need to uh, adhere to in our government is the same way the laws it's the Supreme Court laws and all those laws that the city makes or the state makes or the government makes that these things are important for us to adhere to but be careful when you're talking about the laws of the Bible about the law and the prophets of the Old Testament that the 
legalistic teachers that we see today are putting things on their congregation that they can't even keep themselves. And, and it's a load of, that they can't even carry. And we walk away, and a lot of people take these things so serious, and, and it's such a load on them that it almost weighs them down to just throwing their hands up and just giving up. The Lord isn't that way. The Lord has a plan, and the Lord has a gentle way of instructing us and guiding us and, and taking us down that path to his kingdom. Let's go back now and watch. See, we're to t teach the Bible. As teachers, we are to teach the scriptures as we see them there. And then God will tell us how it can apply to our problems. Because of their fixation on power, let's turn to Matthew 23, 12. It says, But those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And because of their judgmentalism, let's turn to Matthew 23, 13. It says, How terrible it will be for you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees Hypocrites, he says, for you won't let others enter the kingdom of God and you won't go in yourselves. Obviously, Jesus is saying here, by the way you're teaching and your legalism and the way that you're coming down and, and teaching the word that I've given you, you're chasing them away. You're actually chasing them away. You won't let them enter the kingdom kingdom of God because you say that they're not worthy. And you won't come in either because you are teaching the wrong things. Now because of their insistence on meaningless doctrinal distinctions, let's go to Matthew 23, 16. Jesus says, blind guides, how terrible it will be for you. For you say that it means nothing to swear by God's temple. You can break that oath. But then you say that it is binding to swear by the gold in the temple. Verse 17. Blind fools. Which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? This is a teaching that uh, had to do with the religious things at the time. But we can also relate it to today, I think. We have so many problems in our country and now in the whole world. And it comes from greed, <laughs> which the Bible says is, is bad too, but wanting the material things. They have thirsting and lusting after what we can get for ourselves and for our family and for these things. Well, that's, it's, it's okay. But now we see it all falling away. And people are struggling. It's like the depression. <laughs> My grandfather used to tell me about the depression, but we're going through that same type of thing now. It's the, the material things, when they fall away, when you can't get that car, when you lose your job, when, when everything just seems to fall apart on, on you, and you lose your house and everything, you think life is over. Well, what's more important? Those things, or life itself, Oh, this beautiful world that God has given us to live in, the wonderful plan that he has uh, for us, the way we can use our brains to figure out a way of, of maybe producing something we can offer as, in return for, for the other things that we need, the love of, of just living and love of our neighbors and working together with our neighbors. These, these things are more important than all the material things that we're looking for today. If we could just wake up every morning healthy and happy and, and with our children or with the ones we love, I just see a lot more happier people living out on the street nowadays <laughs> than those that have the big homes and their, their mortgages are going down the tubes and all that. Because they never had to rely on the material things. They just relied on life and the friends that they had and the people that, that they knew and, and uh, what they could produce. Then some of them go around to trash cans and pick up trash and, and recycle it to get enough money for food to eat. That's well, a hard way to go. Before, they would just grow a little garden. <laughs> grow a garden with the kind of foods that they needed 
the grains and stuff to make bread and all of that, and it was sufficient for them. There's something to be learned in all of this, and we've just gone too far, I think. And it's, we're not getting the answers, but we could if we just look at the teachings of the Bible. Let's continue on now with this, okay? See the material things. The, we are so much into our lifestyle as, as human beings in this world. And when we go into church, it's the material things. It's how does the church look? Where is the altar? A lady once came into our church. And we had just started, and we didn't have anything but a little pulpit. And her daughter was getting married, and she walked in. She said, where's the altar? Like she wasn't going to let her daughter get married in a place like this. You know, we're two or more together than God is with us, right? But we put more emphasis on those things then we do the place where God is. If he's with us, the temple. If he's with us, whether it's a room or if you're standing outside or in that space, in that temple where, where we are in the presence of God is more important than the material things that are there. Because of their laws at the expense of charitable demands of God's law, Let's look at Matthew 23, 23. How terrible it will be for you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, he says that all the time, hypocrites, he says again, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest part of your income, but you ignore the important things of the law, like justice and mercy and faith. Yeah, you should tithe, but not at the expense of justice, mercy, and faith. That's having an open mind. That's having a broad mind. How are you going to have justice unless you are broad-minded enough to see the whole picture of someone's life? How can you show mercy unless you know that person and know what they're going through? And how can you know that it will all be solved if you have the faith and encourage their faith to know that God is with them every minute? We see Jesus very angry not just because of what has happened in the past and in his own time, but because he knows that the same things will happen again in the future, even now. Just once again, Matthew 23 Jesus, his home is Jerusalem, and he says these things. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks neath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. What an amazing image. Jesus, like a mother hen, kept from her children by those who claim to be God's anointed. This is the reason for his anger and emotional outbursts. This passage in the book of Matthew is so strong, so stunning, that you might think church people forever think twice before setting themselves up as institutional dictators and merciless judges before invoking the names of the past saints in order to extinguish the flames of present saints and yet from generation to generation the spiritual descendants of those scribes and Pharisees have done precisely that but those of us who are not legalistic Christians we must remember one thing we don't delight in dividing humanity into the saved and the unsaved. And we don't want to see legalists suffer eternal separation from God either. Like it appears that the teachers of the law and the Pharisees we read about were. And we don't believe in God who wants that either. The thing that most of us who might be called non-legalistic broad-minded Christians can have a, a difficult time believing in, however, is a Savior 
who, in the fullness of his humanity, responded with a compassion as perfect as his father's to those who sought to cut him off from the children he loved. Well, that's it, and I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, broad-mindedness. <laughs> you understand that? I was just yeah, saying. of course. He, Angel teaches me more than I know. I, I, Angel has all the answers. I know he tries. He makes good coffee too. I'd Thank you. Like it. That's dead. I don't want to lose my job. <laughs> See you next time. Bye, everybody. God bless you.